New York's one house budgets for the Assembly and Senate moving forward, how their plans differ from the governor's, and what the budget may ultimately look like. Hi everybody, welcome to Empire State Weekly. I'm Ryan Peterson here in Albany. Senate and Assembly passing those budget proposals this week. Final resolutions differ slightly from the governor's initial $227 billion spending plan. Resolutions are both billions of dollars more than the executive proposed budget. Both houses rejecting a SUNY tuition increase. Senate and Assembly also rejecting the governor's proposal to make changes to bail reform, a controversial issue between both Democrats and Republicans. Joining us now to give us some reaction to the passage of the One House budgets, Rebecca Gerard, the Legislative Director for Citizen Action. Rebecca, thanks so much for joining us. A pleasure to be here. So talk to me about your initial reaction here now that the Assembly and the Senate have their uh, proposals out there. What are the things that are standing out to you most that you're most pleased to see? I want to name, first of all, that I think overall the One House budgets were a, a tremendous reflection of the needs of everyday New Yorkers. Specifically, we were extremely pleased to see the housing proposals on both sides, as well as in at least one side, inclusion of additional child care funding, um, great climate initiatives, and the repudiation of uh, bail changes that were requested by the government. Let's talk about that housing initiative for a second, too. And the, and the governor has talked about that housing compact as well, looking to build some 800,000 units or so over the next 10 years. Is the state doing enough in your eyes going forward here to, to make housing more affordable to, to the everyday New Yorker? I mean, I think what we'll, we'll see, right, is how the enacted budget ends up. Mm -hmm. But the one house proposals really address the glaring gaps in the governor's proposal. People are in a housing crisis in New York, have been for decades. It was exacerbated by the pandemic. And so we need instant solutions that address the crisis that millions of New Yorkers are in, in terms of being able to afford rent and in terms of being displaced from their, from their homes due to predatory development. So the inclusion of good cause eviction, the inclusion of, inclusion of the housing access voucher program, those are the types of policies that provide relief right now. Now, to get back to the bail reform measures, we, neither one of the, the House One budgets really do anything at all, kind of letting it stand as it is, even though there are some people out there that feel it still needs some tweaking, not a full repeal, but at least a lot of people talking about giving judges back a little bit more discretion. Is that something you can agree with? I think they did exactly the right thing. Mm -hmm. You know, people wanting to feel safe in their communities is understandable and val valid. And yet what we know is that the laws passed in 2019 are not contributors to any harm that's being experienced in communities. The data completely verifies that. What we need to do is invest in communities so that we don't have situations where poverty and disinvestment drive both harm uh, perpetuity, right, and experience, mm -hmm. those are those are the answers for, for achieving public safety. How big a problem right now is child care in your eyes, Rebecca, for a lot of families out there across the state? I mean, it's a huge issue, right? We, we know this, it predominantly impacts um, women-led households and specifically women of color-led households. People need to be able to go to work, right? We say that's what we want, uh, to have a healthy, not just economy, but community. And yet the lack of availability and affordability of health care disproportionately impacts um, low income and black and brown communities. So it's crucial that we have not just increased funding for access, but increased funding for providers who service those communities. You also comment, uh, commend the Assembly and Senate for, for shooting down the proposal of, of 100 new charter schools that the governor had included in her executive proposal. Is that correct? That is correct. We know that investment in public institutions, such as education, is the path to making sure that everyone in the state and in the country has equal access and opportunity. And so putting money into the hands of the privatization of such a process um, will only increase the discrepancy in access to education um, and not decrease it. So any money spent 
by the state should always go directly into our public education system. State of New York also moving forward rather boldly with a lot of issues to address climate change and the climate crisis. How do policies of that nature benefit the everyday citizen? I mean, I think that's a great question that I'm glad you asked because the reality is the Senate proposal on climate does exactly what we want it to do. Money is not enough to solve the climate crisis. It's totally necessary, but it's not enough. We need to make sure that the money being spent is directed towards alleviating those who've been on the front lines of the climate crisis, which again, to no surprise, are low-income black and brown communities who have experienced disproportionate uh, lack of infrastructure, disproportionate proximity to environmental hazards. And so when we think about spending the money to ensure that, that the climate issue is addressed both proactively, but in a protective measure, there have to be significant guardrails that direct the funding in those directions. I'm interested, uh, finally, as we get ready to wrap up here, Rebecca, your thoughts on gun violence. Of course, the state itself has some of the strictest gun laws in the nation. There are still people out there that feel more could be done. Are you happy with what the state is doing when it comes to gun safety measures? I, I am, right? I mean, I think availability of guns is a significant problem, not just in this state, but in this country. We know when we compare ourselves to other countries, right? It's, it's obvious that the presence of firearms basic presence, right, um, is a direct correlation to the amount of, of violence and harm that we see. I think the state is hindered in a lot of sense, right, in a lot of capacity. Between federal guidelines, we saw some of the measures that were passed by the state um, be struck down and need to be edited because of federal policy. But I, I think the state is leading on this issue, and, and federal policies really need to move in order to support what, what this state knows is, is the right approach. And the absolute final here, do we see an on-time budget? I like to ask this of everybody. <laughs> I highly doubt it. My, <laughs> if I were a betting woman, I would say absolutely not. All right, coming up awfully quickly, lots of debate left to go. Rebecca Garrard, the Legislative Director for Citizens Action of New York, thank you so much for your time. Much appreciated. Thank you. New York officials reassuring citizens their money is secure. Following two large banking failures, we'll speak with a financial expert on what caused those back-to-back -back failures. Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank here in New York when we come back. All right, welcome back to Empire State Weekly. I'm Ryan Peterson here in Albany. State officials continue to reassure customers after DFS seized control of Signature Bank, a move happening as Silicon Valley Bank faced a collapse out in California. Now, the collapse of SVB was due to rising interest rates, creating that run on the bank from depositors worried that they may lose their money. This soon led to the FDIC shuttering that bank, stopping withdrawals. Governor Hochul explaining the seizure here in New York was to avoid any ripple effects caused by the instability with Silicon Valley. All right, joining us now to give us some additional insight into these financial matters is Brian Clark. Brian's an associate professor, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. We thank you for joining us, Brian. Thanks for giving us the time. Well, thank you for having me. So first of all, let's kind of start here. Silicon Valley Bank. Now, this was not a household name, but at the time, 16th largest bank in the country by assets. How come this is some place that, that folks around here hadn't heard of? Well, one, it's it's in Silicon Valley, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I, I think we need to put it in perspective a little bit. So, so the 16th largest largest bank in the U.S. is still, in terms of you know the the, the mega banking standards, is still a regional bank, right? It's about six percent the size of J.P. Morgan, mm. which is the largest bank um, in in the U.S. by assets. So, and we're talking about 209 billion, um, mm -hmm. mainly a, a lot of. Uh, tech companies kind of made a name for themselves out there with, with tech startups. What exactly happened here? I know there's a lot of, you know, technical things behind the scenes of what went on here, but for the general layperson at home, what do they need to understand about how this collapse happened? Okay. 
Yeah, so, so I, I think that there's a quite a few things that happened at once here. And so anytime you get one of these major failures, it, it tends to mean more than one thing happening at, at the same time. So as everyone knows, we had inflation's been you know sky high for the last coming out of the pandemic. And so the Federal Reserve has mm -hmm. been raising interest rates, which have in an attempt to bring down inflation, and it seems to be working. And so one thing that, you know, Right now, if, if you just listen to anything about the Fed, you hear about their price stability mandate, which is you know to control inflation. But the Federal Reserve also has another mandate, which which again is to maintain financial stability. And so, in the broad setting, by by raising these interest rates, especially at the short-term interest rates, that that's essentially bad for financial stability, right? Typically, if if banks get in trouble, the, the Fed will lower interest rates, and so that's affecting all banks. Now, the concern specifically was, so why this didn't hit all banks is that a lot of banks have some proper risk management. And so they could sort of see these rates rising. And so they structured their, their investments in such a way that they were less sensitive to the change in interest rates. It appears that Silicon Valley Bank did not do this. And essentially their investments, which were really in long-term bonds and similar assets, lost a lot of value as the Fed was increasing interest rates. Now, what eventually had, you know, triggered the actual run on the bank was that the depositors from mm -hmm. Silicon Valley Bank, you know, it would be like you and I putting in money to mm -hmm. a normal bank. It, it, it's insured by the FDIC up to $250,000, which is fine for most individual borrowers. But Silicon Valley Bank was, was unique in the sense that they have a lot of depositors, which are small or medium sized businesses, which have on the order of tens of millions of dollars in right. the bank. And so anything above 250,000 is not insured. And so when word got out that the asset side or, or the asset side of Silicon Valley's balance sheet was losing value, they started pulling money out. And this happened very quickly. And then once you know one depositor starts taking money out, the word gets out very quickly, in this case through social media, and a lot of major depositors started pulling money out, which meant that the bank had to sell more and more assets. And you can see this sort of downward spiral, and that, sure. that's when the Fed really stepped in. And they stepped in awfully quickly. And of course, a lot of people were screaming bailout, but they assured everybody that this was money being used, that these banks were actually paying in themselves to kind of help them out here. That's how I understand it anyway, correct? Yeah, I, I think that's the narrative. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, I, I think it is, you know, <laughs> the money has to be come from somewhere. Um, and so the, the federal, the FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Company, they're, they're the ones that insure all the small deposits. Yes, they, it is true they collect fees and, and that money is insured, but basically the Fed bailed out or you know, made all the depositors whole, meaning that, but that money's got to come from somewhere eventually, right? right? And, and so at the end of the day, you know, that, that you know, someone's going to have to pay into a fund to, um, to pay for that, and eventually that will trickle down, I, th I think, to ultimately to either borrowers or taxpayers in, in general. Now, of course, you've got a lot of politicians, uh, mainly Democrats at the moment, screaming about the, the changes that were made back in 2018. And we're talking about banking regulations and how strict things were monitored for certain size banks. And the, the threshold was initially, from what I understand, about $50 billion. But that got increased to about $250 billion until you face these most strict uh, oversight rules. And a lot of people are saying that had that not been put into place, that maybe, maybe, we don't obviously know for sure, that this wouldn't have happened with Silicon Valley Bank. Yeah, it, it, that, that's certainly possible. Um, but, you know, the, the flip side of that is, and, and so well, let me take a step back. So the reason it's sure. possible is because the, the difference in regulating, you know, a, a regular a regional sized bank like Silicon Valley now and the mega banks is the mega banks go through things like the Fed and the OCC's stress testing. Um, protocols where they, where they have to forecast if an event like this were to happen, what would happen to the balance sheet? And so presumably that would would have been caught in a stress test. Um, and so those stress tests would have been more stringent for this this size bank. Um, but the flip side is, you know, the, the small banks or the banks of this size <laughs> wanted to get out of that regulation as well. Right. Um, and, and so I, I think, you know, the regulators, I think, are partially to blame, but, but I think a lot of it rests with, with the bank management and, and, the, and basically the poor risk management that the decisions that they made. Now, Signature Bank was, was another uh, bank that got taken over by the feds here in New York State. How did that happen? Was that kind of something that, that sort of just trickled down from what happened out west? What, what was the situation there? 
Yeah, it, it seems to be mostly a contagion risk. And, yeah. and I think one of the things that happened, so the reason that back in you know 1913 that, that they, they put in uh, deposit insurance was to stop bank runs like this, because bank runs used to happen all the time. Anytime mm-hmm. there was a rumor that a bank was in trouble, people would run to the bank and take their money out. Now you don't run to the bank, you just you know wire the money to yourself or withdraw it. Um, but something that the, the unique part about the signature bank that was similar to Silicon Valley is they have a lot of large uninsured depositors. And so any bank that had these large uninsured depositors, those individuals got nervous very quickly and withdrew their funds. It just happened to be that, that, that the signature bank tended to have more of these uninsured depositors. And before the Fed said that they were going to sort of make all depositors whole and effectively insure all depositors, people started pulling their money out and that's why the Fed stepped in so quickly. And we're kind of seeing, unfortunately, this happening now most recently with Credit Suisse uh, overseas. For, for folks that are watching, Brian, you know, folks like myself, that you know, we're just at a regular kind of consumer bank, if you will, there really are any concerns for us, correct? No, I, I mean, so, so if, if, first off, if you have your money in, so I know mm-hmm. that my savings account are, are well below the $250,000 right. yeah. limit. <laughs> and, and so if, if you're in that situation where, where your savings in a, in a bank are under $250,000, it's, it's insured by the FDIC. There's never been a case where a, a depositor has lost their money, you know, above the FDIC limit. Um, and, and so that, you know, you should feel safe having your money in, in, you know, in an insured account. The other thing is, you know, this this doesn't seem to be anywhere close to the situation we were in in 2008. Right. Right. In 2008, we had the biggest of the big banks were really in trouble. And, you know, some failed, they got bailed out. And, you know, it's, it's kind of still controversial if they would have failed or not on their own. But these were the top banks. Again, like I said at the very beginning, this, you know, Silicon Valley is the 16th largest bank, but it's still 6% of JP Morgan's mm-hmm. assets. So, you know, putting things in perspective, it, it, this is at least now, unless there, you know, there's something else going on, which it doesn't seem to be, um, it doesn't seem to be anywhere close to, you right. know, like a, a, a real financial crisis. Certainly something to keep our eye on though, for sure. Brian Clark from RPI, I really appreciate your time, Brian. Thanks so much. All right, thank you. And New York lawmakers are looking to tackle pay inequality. When we return, details on a new bill could help close that gender pay gap. Welcome back to Empire State Weekly. I'm Ryan Peterson here in Albany. Tuesday this week was Equal Pay Day, which is dedicated to raising awareness of that gender pay gap. So how much of a gender gap is there when it comes to pay? Proposed legislation could help answer that question. Capital correspondent Amel Talegi has the details. Senator Brad Hoyleman Siegel is sponsoring legislation that would require companies that do business with the state to disclose any pay gaps that may exist. So that New Yorkers can see if their tax dollars are going to companies with disparities in employee pay not just by gender, but by race or ethnicity as well. The bill was passed in both houses last year, but then vetoed by the governor. Some people have said the gender pay gap has been disproven. If the pay gaps do exist, um, we need to eradicate them. And that's part of what our legislation would do. I think most social scientists would confirm the fact that pay gaps exist. There are statewide and national organizations that focus on this issue. A study by Pew Research Center shows that in 2022, women ages 25 to 34 earned an average of 92 cents for every dollar earned by men in the same age group, an eight cent gap. But that study did not denote if those surveyed worked the same jobs. It did measure the difference in median and hourly earnings between men and women who worked full or part time. That survey was conducted online among 5,000 adults. Ron Deutsch, director of New Yorkers for Fiscal Fairness, says fields that are dominated by women traditionally pay lower wages. We've been fighting in New York for additional funds for child care workers, for home care workers, for human service workers. And these are some of the most important jobs we have in society. He says they're so important they deserve to be compensated fairly. And these fields pay uh, wages that are, you know, significantly less than other positions uh, in our state. And we need to do a better job of making sure that those positions pay more um, because of the importance of that work. Reporting in Albany, Amel Talegi. Thank you to Amel. New government report is raising eyebrows across country, especially among anyone interested in extraterrestrials. Yeah, we'll explain. <music> Thank you.
All right, and finally from us here on Empire State Weekly, something unique out of D.C., the Pentagon's new office investigating unidentified aerial phenomenon says there's a possibility an alien mothership, yes, you heard that correctly, visited our solar system in 2017. A physicist and Harvard professor who works with the Pentagon explains why they think this is a possibility. Listen. We consider a possibility where an object as big as Oumuamua, which was a um, football field size, uh, is a mothership. How about that? Now, he went on to explain the object, which he called Oumuamua, didn't have the characteristics you'd find in meteors or other known objects. Interesting. They are out there. All right, for now, from all of us here on Empire State Weekly, I'm Ryan Peterson in Albany. We'll see you right back here next week. And don't forget, you can catch us all over the state of New York. Here's the full schedule of where you can watch Empire State Weekly on 10 television stations across New York.